Hey everybody, welcome back to a new episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. On this episode, this is a crew show, and by crew, I mean Ryan Douthat and Nick Capetto, and we are talking about analog SUVs. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you heard myself and Ryan talk about four-wheel drive systems and new technology in the four-wheel drive systems, which is better, which is worse, but now we're actually going to talk about SUVs uh kind of we're gonna we're gonna talk about the analog style suvs because these are quickly going out of production and we asked the question are the new suvs and trucks better than the old suvs and trucks when it comes to off-roading so guys how you guys doing today doing great mike always great to be here thanks for having us (laughs) absolutely awesome thanks now I, I mean, here, here's the cool part. All of us are SUVs and four-wheel drive guys, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan tests SUVs all over the planet. He cu- currently has a, uh, a Ford Ranger Tremor, if That's I'm right. not mistaken. Yep. Um, Nick, Nick, what do you have? Uh, GS470 Lexus, is that right? Yeah, 2006 GX 470. GX 470, right? And, and his I GX 470 yeah. is lifted with how big yes. are the wheels on that? The tires on that thing? Uh, 34s. Yeah. Okay. So, so you <laughs> you got you got some rubber on there. Um, yeah. I currently have a '96 Bronco, a '90 Grand Wagoneer, and a 2002 Grand Cherokee. Um, two of the Jeeps are solid live axle, front and rear. Um, mm-hmm. Bronco is I beam, but they are completely analog transfer cases and everything else. Um, so let let's talk about that. So well, Ryan, you're also you, the you're the caretaker too for the uh, Durango from Hemmings as well, right? That, that's correct. And no. we just have our, our brand new Durango. Um four SUVs. Jesus, that's that's a bit that's a bit crazy. But let Ryan brought up before we jumped on this, Ryan brought up a very interesting point. He said that SUVs, the analog kind that we kind of love, like the the uh, and I and I'm going to rope like the Toyota 4Runner into this and mm-hmm. the Durango are very somewhat classic. Um, well, the forerunner hasn't changed for like 15 years. So, we well, that's right. Has one foot, it is definitely old style. <laughs> so, why, let 2023 me, on the label, but it ain't a 2023. <laughs> well, that's that's right. So, let me ask you this: Why do you think that these old school SUVs, these mm-hmm. platforms that have been around for, you know, 15 years now, mm-hmm. right, are still selling like crazy, and that in recent years, especially this, sales have gone through the roof. Yeah, uh, if you look at the sales graphs for the Forerunner, uh, it did pretty well when it was first initially launched. It had a complete yeah. redesign about mm, ten years ago, roughly. Yeah. Um, it did well, and then it kind of dipped down a little bit. But like best sales year ever for the Forerunner was last year. Before that, the That's best insane. sales year was the year before that. And like, and we're talking in the midst of a pandemic, and I think that that actually has pushed people to more of these type of vehicles because people are like. Well, I can't fly anywhere. Um, I can't go see shows. Do you know what I like to do? I'm going to go up into the mountains. I'm going to go camping or right. I want to go do this, do that. And when you start thinking about that, I think the first thing beyond capability, the first thing that comes to mind is reliability. I and once you start that. getting into a lot of these modern vehicles with like hybrid power systems or um, even like the Rivian, which is full electric, it's mm-hmm. a big unknown. Um, you know, as soon as you start thinking electric, you're like, whoa, where can I charge in the forest? You know, right? <laughs> yeah, might be an issue. Might be an issue. <laughs> well, and that, and it's that's a great point because I know if I take my stuff off road, if I take my Bronco, if I take my Jeeps off road, mm-hmm. one of the things that I I constantly have in the back of my mind is I can probably get myself out of something if something breaks, right? Yeah. Especially on the old Jeeps and the Bronco, the transfer cases are manual. Yeah, right. If there are linkages, you could get in there, you could physically see what's going on. Yeah. Whereby in the new SUVs and the new off road vehicles, you really can't. You can't fix them. I mean, and I think I mean, that it's, it's beyond, I don't think most people are actually ever going to fix their vehicles in the field. I, I don't either. But I think people want to feel like they can um, or they want to feel like they understand it or they think that it's simple enough. Like, I mean, Forerunner is so incredibly simple. It's a part time. Yes. In 2022, 23 Mm -hmm. uh, four wheel drive system. It has a locking rear differential with a hard lock uh, and it uses a, a. the traction control a track system for a front locker equivalent. Mm-hmm. So it like shovels power back and forth. Um, it's pretty old school. And like Nick has what is probably the next general, you know, I don't want to say the yeah. next generation. He has the upper, uh, the upper class version of old school. <laughs> 
in that Alexis. it's A, Alexis, but then B, yeah. also it is using a full-time system. You want to explain that, Nick? Well, honestly, the full-time system, I couldn't explain it. It's just, just how <laughs> it works. But I know, all I know is that I have a lot less buttons than some of the new SUVs, and I love that because all I have to do <clears throat> to go into a four low is just put the car in neutral and then just jam the second joystick because it's a manual transfer case, jam into four low, and mm -hmm. I'm good to go. On some of the newer cars, like we've been driving the Tacoma and uh, the Forerunner recently, and there's some issues with locking the rear differential where you have to roll forward, roll backwards. And if you're in a situation where you need to, like where you need to get into four low yeah. or lock, lock the diff, and you have to roll forward and backwards, so that's not an option. So it's just the rel reliability of in the situation. I would go with my car before a new car. Granted, when they do work, the new cars are a lot more capable. Yeah. And I'm going to get a little off track here because we kind of skipped past it. But I'm going to go back to in the field you guys are talking about. I would never fix my car in the field. Well, hopefully you never have to fix your car in the field. Sure. But if you were to break in an older SUV, there's ways. Or you can just put it in neutral and get towed out. Mm -hmm. And some of the new cars, like especially like the Rivians and Teslas, especially the Rivians, I've actually seen a few times where people, their Rivian just turns into a brick where right. something goes wrong and they can't move it. There was this That's guy. A very was, good point. Watching. It becomes yeah. a huge brick and there's nothing yeah. you can do. Forget about getting spare yeah. parts too. Yeah, drag it out. I mean, that's that's the whole thing. Well, let, let me ask you, do you think that the manufacturers, and, and that's a great point, Nick. Do you think the manufacturers are looking at these vehicles going, well, you're not going to have to worry because they're just not going to break, which we know is BS because everything <laughs> everything breaks eventually, right? Well, you if know, you're off-roading you you're going to break something. You're going to break something. Yeah, but do you think that the manufacturers are saying, well, people aren't going to utilize these or off-road them that hard to the point where they do break? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, do well, you think that, that's, that's a, you know? Well, I think that I think that's, that is the case because, I mean, Teslas, you're not going to be off-roading a Tesla because they don't make an off-road specific vehicle yet. Right. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, even in that case, talking about electric vehicle companies, they're so computerized that they have so much control over them. And they kind of have... Well, especially Tesla, everybody knows that Tesla does not want you working on the Tesla. They yeah, want right. you to take it in or have someone come out to it. So for them to think about, or even Rivian, for you to work on a car, it's one, it's impossible. Everything's a computer unless you you're right. an IT genius. Yeah. Unless you're a genius, you're not going to be working on an electric vehicle compared to like a gas powered V8 or something like that. So mm -hmm. I think it, I think that it's not even that they're they're not wanting you to work on them. They're just not even thinking it's possible because they're, I, they're so complex. I think also like in the case of Rivian, because Rivian has a lot of off-road specific features. They have amazing ground clearance. Uh, mm -hmm. They talk about, their, they boast their off-road modes. And, and in my opinion, if anything has an off-road mode, that you means go off -road. you should be able to go off-road. Not always the case, right. but um, that's my personal belief. And I think something with like the Rivian, you know, it's, the the features are good and on paper it looks good i haven't yeah. driven one myself but i have friends that have driven them and i've watched some of my friends videos and i'm like did that really happen and they're like yeah that really happened uh where like you're climbing and you have all the power to one wheel and even though it has massive torque to that one wheel it still can't climb and right. theoretically it should so i think a lot of the like even rivian a lot of the features like tank turns and um sure where you're spinning in one place and all this other stuff, it looks good. It's all good marketing. Uh, the same way, a, I, the same way that Kia you... shows their cars driving to the tops of mountains, but you're like, you can't do that with that car. And I think it all comes down to marketing. They're just marketing to a segment that wants to feel like they can do that, but never, ever will. And then guys like me get our hands on them and we're like, yeah, that doesn't really do that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really hurt their sales because again, the people they're catering to are the people who you know, they're going to go up skiing for the weekend or they're going to sure. go to the lightest trail you can imagine. And of that's course. a stream to them. Um, and and to that to that ends, it works. But if we're talking about honest, like Nick drove like the BDR, which is the back uh, back roads, back country discovery route, um, which is basically dirt roads from across entire states. Like you can, yeah. you can navigate most of the Western states without ever going yeah. onto a pavement road or very little of it. And like, Nick, what did you see along those? Like, uh, you know, like, what kind of vehicles did you see along those routes? 
I mean, so I did the Colorado one in its entirety. Well, actually, that's not true. I went about three quarters of the way. The rest was into Wyoming, and I was like, that's For the sake of the that podcast, you don't have to be too specific. I mean, right. you don't have to yeah. be too yeah. accurate. What, what, did you, what vehicles did you see back there? <laughs> so in Colorado, the vehicles I saw were uh, a lot of tours coming out of Colorado. So it's a lot of Range Rovers, Land Cruisers, mm-hmm. yeah. Jeeps for sure. And then me and Alexis, and that's about it. Um, <laughs> A lot of a lot of Toyota 4Runners, Tundras, things like that. Well, the Tundra is tough because it's such a big vehicle. So it's it's a lot of the midsize mm-hmm. vehicles that are okay. around the size of the GX. But l- let me ask you, do you think that because these systems are getting so complex? And l- here's the thing. Like, yes, we talk about or I talk about, well, maybe I could get myself out of a situation if something actually breaks. Mm-hmm. And the fact of the matter is I might be able to. But unless I have the part that broke. Mm-hmm. Probably not. I'm probably getting towed out of somewhere, right? So do, do you think that, again, that idea that people think they can do stuff and think mm-hmm. they can get out of a situation as opposed to knowing they can't with a brand new four-wheel drive system because they, they can't work on it, do you think that is really kind of pushing these analog trucks to, to record sales numbers? I mean, I can give a really good example. So the GX470 that I have, there's a new version of the GX460, has a different motor and a couple different things. But yeah. I, I'm on a Facebook page. I think it's around like 10,000 people now. But okay. it's, it's specifically for the Lexus platform. And I see time and time again, especially since COVID, uh, people switching from a new 4Runner or a newer like commuter car, switching to an older luxury SUV that's more analog just because yeah. – if they do want to go off roading, one, they don't want to damage a seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollar car. Sure. Well, of course, sure. cars dollars. are expensive these days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. They don't want to damage the really expensive car, but also there's less to go wrong. So, with with this situation, sure. like like what like what is there to go wrong? So I basically just have a V8 all time four wheel drive, four low center lock, mm-hmm. hit, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. You put a lift on it, big tires, and you have a pretty capable vehicle. Sure. Now you can go, you can go crazy and do lockers and things like that. But even then an air locker, what's really to go wrong on the new cars. There's a bunch of like, I mean, you got a bunch of buttons and then the whole electrical system that, that runs that button to the computer, yeah. to the ECU. Like, you know what I mean? There's a lot more to go wrong, a lot more electrical. And nine times out of 10, people don't know how to work on electrical stuff. And if you're in the field, you're not going to be climbing around in the, in the fuse box and in right. the wires and stuff right. to figure out why your button's not working. So I see it a lot where people switch from a newer SUV and if they want to go off-roading and kind of do like the overlanding thing. And I put quotations around that because fair, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it's a blanket term for, for off-roading with money pretty much. That's, yeah. that's well, what well, I call it. It's off-roading trails, money. forest roads. Off-roading is, I yeah. think that's, that's the other part, right? Like there are so many different, mm-hmm. um, so many different definitions of, of off-roading like you know 90 i don't want to say 90 i'm going to say 60 percent of the off-roading that people do with their jeeps their suvs or whatever mm-hmm. have you can be ju- done just as well in a two-wheel drive vehicle w- with a limited slip in the back yeah. right I agree. um yep you know like perfect example years ago we took a 325i bfw with some bfg ko2s through wheeler pass which is a pretty decent like off-road thing is that just like the most mike version of off-roading you ever heard although you know if you did with the daytona with ko2 yeah exactly but okay fair point anyway moving but, on but i mean we <laughs> did that to prove that you know one a great set of tires will take you places mm-hmm. and two a limited slip differential goes a long way it does in I, getting yeah. you 80 percent of the places you need to go one thing I'd I also... love about my Ranger is that I can actually go in two wheel drive and lock the rear diff in two wheel drive. None of the Toyotas let you do that. See, you that's great. Polo. And I, I've tested a lot of situations where typically you need to be in four wheel drive and the locked rear works just fine. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's well, that, more, a more common feature, I think, well, but I don't it, think people understand it. No. And it, it's interesting that you bring that up. So I remember when I first got my Bronco, uh, we had taken it off road mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, I realized when I put it in four wheel drive that my four wheel drive uh, didn't work. My my <laughs> yeah, the little button on the dash, the vacuum operated hubs, they didn't connect. And I was like, son of a bitch. Yeah. However, that's also when I learned because I didn't know at the time that I did have a limited slip in the back. 
managed to pull myself out just by slamming my foot to the floor yeah. and getting her and, and, and I got out. Um, but the fact is I completed this massive, massive off-road excursion mm -hmm. in two-wheel drive yeah. with a limited slip and a great set of tires. And I was shocked at how well the truck did. As soon as I got home, got rid of the vacuum hubs, instantly put on manual lockers, right? Yeah. And that changed everything because mm -hmm. it, it is that, I think that mindset of when you are manually doing something and you hear that click or feel that clunk or that mm -hmm. thud when you're physically putting it into a it's mode, satisfying. <laughs> it's, it's satisfying, right? Very much so, yeah. <laughs> but you're like, okay, well, I know it, I know it's in gear or I know it's in four wheel drive because I know the hubs are locked now yeah. because I physically did it. Um, so yeah, that's take that idea. And I want to go down another little side road here. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the modern systems and future systems all rely on brake vectoring where they're mm -hmm. applying brake to a spinning wheel to distribute yeah. power to the other wheel. Um, and I've also seen this in the Rivian, sorry, Rivian, um, where it's spinning the wheel that's not having grip. Yeah. But one of the major problems with that that's really not talked about much is that really does degrade, um, it degrades the trail that they're mm -hmm. on because it's literally digging holes in the trail. Right as you go. So it's damaging roads, it's damaging trails. Um, and with the old hard locker systems, they're far less dramatic, but that's good because you end up with a lot less of this random spinning, digging holes, making ruts yeah. for the next person. Um, it, you're treading lighter with these older systems, uh, yeah. which is kind of this, like you would think that, oh, modern, it's going to be so much better. But in fact, what they're doing is they're getting rid of the physical linkage because honestly, it's cheaper and using right. brake vectoring instead. But that has some trade-offs environmentally. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the guys from the... Uh, the Washington, whoever manages the trails in Washington state called me once and was asking about that. That was actually one of their concerns when they were yeah. looking to buy their next fleet of vehicles was what's going to have the lowest impact on the trails. And I'm like, kind of given your specifications, kind of, you need a forerunner because that's the only thing that's big enough, you know, station, yeah. but small enough to still go on the trails, but also doesn't rely on that wheel braking uh, right. necessarily from the rear to get up the trail. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those, those weird, kind of things is that they just damage the trail more <laughs> yeah well I, you know it's but here's the other part and i don't want to i don't want to make it sound like these the older suvs are better because from an off-road perspective uh the perfect example like we we did some pretty serious off-roading in the new bronco in nevada yeah and um i was shocked you know i most was of the stuff that's good about the new bronco is based on old i agree it's because physical lockers Dual right. transfer yep. case. These are all old school things. That's right. But That's they did, right. They have done their little twist with modern stuff on it. Kind of like yeah. my my, my uh, Ranger is very similar because yeah. it has a modern turbo four. It has mm -hmm. a rear locker that engages anytime, anywhere. You don't have to worry right. about to get the splines all lined up. Right. Meshing but up. Yeah. But there's a give take there. Engineer friend of mine says that the Toyota system is stronger. It's like, okay, fine. Yeah. But if I'm on an incline and I don't want to roll back, 50 times to try to get my splines aligned. Right. I just wanted to go. I'll there take water. Go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And that's, well, I was shocked at, I, you know, we, we got through the, the off-road that we did those trucks. Mm -hmm. And I remember going up and down these, these kind of inclines yeah. um, where I was like, I'm not doing that. Like, and the guy in front of me is like, just come on, you, this will be, be fine. And I was like, I'm going to physically die and crash this truck. <laughs> I was, I was, beyond shocked mm -hmm. at the capabilities of these trucks beyond yeah. shocked because if uh, you know and you always your mind as a guy your mind always goes to like the most extreme situation of like course. If, if the apocalypse happens and i'm being chased by a zombie and all of a sudden i need to go off-road and climb a mountain in this truck that's will this truck be able me. to do it <laughs> right like that's that's the truck that i want yes um and i was i was like there's no way there is no way my 25 year old Bronco would even remotely do the things that this new one did not happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, the, uh, I've done the Land Rover experience before where they mm -hmm. put sure. on the side tilt where you're yep. tilting. And then the guy on the right rolls his window down and grabs some dirt and says, look at that. Cause you're yeah. so far tilted. And then, that's right. And then he makes you go a little bit more. It's really kind of shocking how capable a lot of these vehicles are. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, this has nothing. I think this is relevant. Um, I was on a press <laughs> launch in 2006 for the new Subaru WRX. Yeah. And 
at the time, the RE92s were were maligned as being horrible tires, yet the um, that's what the WRX came with. So on the forums, it's always, oh, I crashed my car because of the RE92s. It's like, yeah, really? Yeah. But that said, on the, it was a, yeah, I think it was the 2000, it was a 2007 model. And anyway, around 2006, my co-driver was a journalist who was previously a professional test driver for GM. Wow. And we're going around corners and he's doing twice the speed that I thought logically you could do. Like, yeah. It it broke my brain how yeah. fast he was able to drive this car with so much confidence, and I was not scared because the right. car felt planted. I'm like, how do you do that? And he's just like, I'm just feeling what the car is doing and yeah. you know, letting the car do its thing. I'm like, that blows my mind. Same thing with off-road. The, the people mm. who are really, really, really good can take anything and go through anything. And those are the guys, right. or at least the guys who feel like they're those guys are the guys who post on YouTube and comments like, I could take a yeah. camera and do that. It's like, yeah, you might be able to, but you know what? Joe, who remember, sure. who's going to go by. Yeah, not doing that. Not doing that. And so for him, this is extreme. This is yeah. beyond what he's ever going to do. And we're conveying that information to him. Like right. this is, it, it may not be impossible. It may not break your vehicle. But there are some things to think about, and this is how the vehicle gets through that. And it's interesting just to see how, uh, you know, the, the actual input we get from people who actually buy these vehicles, what they actually do with them. And, and yeah, obviously, capability at the end of the day comes down to the driver. But these of systems course. are so good, even in these old school vehicles. Because like, how long, Nick, how old is A-Track at this point, which is Toyota's traction control system for off-road? Is that 15, uh, 20 years? Uh, it's it's gotta be 15 years old, dude. At least, at least yeah. Yeah. At and least, so yeah. that that basically removes the need for it was like one of the original systems to use open differentials like yeah. a lock to differential, basically shifting that power around. And it works so good. It makes anybody a superstar, essentially, yeah. in yeah. certain conditions. Um, so for the next generation of stuff, like we, we're talking hard line between the old yep. school stuff. And the new school stuff, the new school stuff right now on paper is looks good, but doesn't actually work as well as it should. The old school stuff we've had decades of development. Correct. They all, they, Correct. They all come down to real basics, but they've been honed to a point where we have some new tech kind of sprinkled mm -hmm. on top that kind of makes them all work better and easier. I mean, I grew up, my grandfather drove a... Um, uh, a Range Rover, I think it was a, it was a 1968 Range Rover. I think it was a series three. That was yeah. just, the, oh, it was a Land Rover. That was the vehicle I knew as the car that somebody would drive every day. I didn't realize until like, right, of course, weird. And he owned three of them, <laughs> but right. at the time. And the reason he bought those was because he, he would drive them all over the place and he was a mechanic and he literally could resurrect any one of those three vehicles anywhere in the world. Right. He could even swap the steering from one side to the other side if you gave him 20 minutes with a wrench. Um, and that's right. what he liked about them was that they were super simple and he could yeah. drive through anything. Um, yeah. And those were very simple. I mean, I think those were kind of akin to almost the Jeep Willys in sure. terms yeah. of how simple they were, but right. they were also British. So they were also unreliable. <laughs> and uh, but, but, uh, do you, but do you think that, you know, again, we're getting into... You know, when we talk about all these these new hybrid drive systems for the four wheel yeah. drives and, and everything else, do you think that it's a lot of it is is nostalgia? Meaning, people mm -hmm. know that these old systems and that these old school body on frame SUVs and stuff are going away, and yeah. that's why they're 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 grabbing them as fast as they can. And and I kind of you know, think a little of that. I mean, the next generation Forerunner Toyota has already said it's going to be made in America. It's not going to be made in Japan like the old ones. And there's a certain level of quality that people have come to expect. Like the Forerunner is bomb proof. That is the general impression for people. Uh, and that bomb proof version has been built in Japan. So yeah. will the American version be as right. good? I don't know. The Tundra right. has had some teething problems with its new generation. That's built in America. You yeah. know, it's like, I don't think the problem is an inherent Japan, America. I think it's more just that factory has been producing it for 20 years. Let's mm -hmm. give it to a brand new factory. We don't yeah, know exactly. what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've, always I agree. <laughs> I mean, just yeah. Like... yeah. I've always said that my, 
Japanese built Lexus and four runners and stuff like that. I feel like the yeah. Japanese ones, me and my friends always talk about how they put an extra quarter turn in every bolt because yeah. some of the stuff I put that car through, it just doesn't make sense. Like a new car would be in the dealership park. But yeah. yeah. Um, one thing, one thing I wanted to touch back on uh, kind of loop back on Ryan is you said something about, um, about how new cars feel like the feedback um, sure. or you mentioned something about it. And that's one thing I, I, I test these cars with you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I, te I test some of the new cars and I drive some of the old. Vehicles. He may not be on Friends camera, have. but he does drive most of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the feedback is the big thing for me. The feedback is not where I want it to be for off-roading. Feedback right. and visibility is the big thing for me. Yeah. It seems yeah, like now. Many with, times, well, how many times are you telling me to turn my wheel while giving me guidance? And I'm like, I can't tell where my wheel is because you yeah, can't yeah. feel it because it's all electronic. So you're like, there's no tension. It must not be cranked. Oh. It's crazy. Well, that, that, that goes <laughs> back to this. And, and that, that goes back to the same where we talk about, you know, sports cars, right? When you yeah. can feel it, the difference between manual brakes and power brakes and, and all the new systems and stuff like that. there I'll is always take a first generation Miata over almost pretty much any other sports car today. Like if I'm going to be spending a track day, first generation Miata, because it gives you the ultimate feedback without too much power. It's well, like, it's like you're so balanced. Right. Feels like you're connected yeah. to the vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. But like, when, when I when I off road my my vehicle, granted I've been driving it for the past five years, I feel like I'm connected with, like you said, Mike. Where mm -hmm. when I when I'm off roading and I feel a rock under my left front tire or my mm -hmm. driver front tire, mm -hmm. I feel that rock and it gives me feedback in the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. In a new car, Absolutely. it just it since it has a like a, electronic steering, it's, yeah, right. The feedback isn't there. Like it just it mutes it almost. And even more so um, now, because first you're talking electronic steering, but all the next generation stuff's all like electronic power too. So at that point, you're not really feeling what the wheels are doing going this way or this way. You correct. know, it's all it's all the machine exactly. kind of trying to figure it out. So all you're really doing is just pointing in a direction and hope it can get through it, which is yeah, not ideal. Yeah. And I think, yeah, uh, to your point, Mike, I think that a lot of people are kind of like, oh. The clock is ticking down. I better mm -hmm. buy one of these now. I've always wanted one of these. I'm staying at home a lot. I think now is the time for me to buy one, even though I have to pay a $25,000 ADM on top of it. That's a additional deal or markup for those watching, um, which is seems to be the common Re thing for these. That's vehicles. insane. <sighs> that, that's insane. Well, we, we know that we know that the technology is advancing. We know yeah. that the, the days, and this has nothing to do with... Um, this basically covers all new vehicles. The yep. days of us wrenching on our own stuff is coming to an end yep. because we simply can't. Mm -hmm. um, the days of 300, 200,000 mile vehicles, I think is coming to an end because of <laughs> the, you know, it's coming to an end because of, of the lack of parts, the lack of technology, the lack of, of keeping up with stuff. So for instance, I look at a, a, a rivet. Well, how long, perfect example, like the mm -hmm. Tesla Roadster. When did that come out? What the new one that was announced and has never. No, no, no. The original Tesla well, the original Roadster. One, is that, tw is that 20 Lotus? years old now? It's about 15. It was the, the Lotus that they put the drive yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I always wonder in, in when, when are those parts going to stop being made? When are people going right. to be not able to, to work on stuff. When is that technology going to get so far out of bounds that we as the consumer can't touch it? But right? I would say that that's not indicative of the technology. That's indicative of the companies that are employing mm. the technology. Because theoretically, an electric motor um, with, you know, uh, an electric car theoretically is way simpler than a gas powered car. You right. have a little spinny thing, the motor, you have brakes, you have tires and a battery pack that's it. You know, yeah. there's no move. There's very little moving parts on electric car. Theoretically, if somebody wanted to, they could create almost a forever car in a way, you know, like yeah. obviously batteries will degrade yeah. over time, yada, yada, all that stuff. But, you know, it, theoretically you could have a 200,000 mile electric car, no problem. Yeah. I think the issue is, is that you have companies like Rivian, um, like Tesla, they're all like chasing. I don't want to say, well, yeah, they're kind of chasing after all these other balls, that's not what mm -hmm. they're focusing on. You know, like Tesla's trying to get down to like, you know, one second, zero to 60, it seems like. Yeah, that makes no sense. That I don't, I don't, you know. <laughs> Who wants well, that? Well, I think Rivian yeah. is kind of going for like to be the ultimate lifestyle vehicle. So they're just piling on all this stuff for lifestyle yeah. vehicle. 
And, and then you have Bollinger out there. I don't know if Bollinger still exists as an ongoing concern, but they had a really cool kind of old retro Land Cruiser. Oh, style. yeah, I remember that. Sure. Cool. That was really cool. Um, but again, you know, building an electric car is easy. Building an electric car company is hard. And right. that's what we're seeing. All these guys come up with these really great concepts. Some of them are like, you know, you look like, Go Bollinger, yeah, maybe that can't be a two hundred thousand mile car, and they're out of business. <laughs> so yeah, it's well, uh, I think I think it, it it has to do with age as well. I know a lot of us, it's you know embracing the yeah. new technology. Yeah. You know, you go okay, well, and the fact of the matter is, listen, odds are it's inherently, I, I think, better. I think for ninety nine percent of the people, they're never going to go and do. And experience what these vehicles are capable of, like a hundred percent, right? Like even Range Rover owners, like Range Rovers are unbelievably capable off road. Very, very few people actually well, take them off. Kind of an interesting thing on that is that, like we we film in the mountains all the time, and sure. over the twenty odd years I've been doing this, we've had to rescue a few cars off the side of the road, and they're almost always some all wheel drive equipped vehicle that was capable of not going off the road there. Right. You no, know, it was capable of not getting stranded, yet people pushed it a little further and didn't know what they were doing. And it's kind of like knowing the limits of your vehicle is kind yeah. of important and knowing the limits of yourself, how far you can go. Typically, sure. the, like the biggest problem most people have is they get high centered on snow. That's like, right. That's what you always see people with all four wheels yeah. going, I can't get it. Yep. And so, luckily, you just need a little tug. And that comes to I ground. Yeah, yeah, I want to touch on that, Ryan, because you bring up you bring up a good point. It seems like a lot of like almost every company now, it seems they're coming out with a off-road based vehicle where they advertise it like a Kia or a Subaru or mm -hmm. some electric cars. They they're releasing like their off-road model, like the X Dominate the mountain. Well, yeah. dude, look, I mean, yeah, listen, so, Porsche just came with a like a Dakar 911. So yeah. well, so what what I'm trying to get at is that they're coming out with these off-road focused machines and it's mm -hmm. giving these people it's giving an ordinary inexperienced person an excuse to buy an off-road vehicle and to go off-road so i almost feel like these companies are instilling confidence in people that there shouldn't be con i feel like i'm getting jumbled on my words but what i'm trying to get at is that yeah. i feel like more so now than ever before more people are getting stuck and more people are damaging their cars and yeah kind of I, get I think, lost up, up I think to, to simplify because... that you, you end up with basically a vehicle that can go up to here in terms of capability um whereas like the forerunner starts here and goes all the way up to here for capability so if you start with a forerunner you can get in over your head but the vehicle can still get you out but with like sure. the but with like the Mazda CX50 Meridian or something like yeah. that you're at its peak capability the moment you take it off road essentially right, you hit right one obstacle you need to get rescued and that's not a knock on that vehicle as it is but i think it's a knock on them again the marketing of how they yeah. pitch them, um, and how they talk about the car you know dominate the mountain go off road you can do anything yeah you're not yeah tell you ride it's like yeah well no. i mean we saw we saw it with the raptor when it first came out the yeah. raptor was oh everybody kind of marketed as it yeah, it, it was marketed as a vehicle you can jump. Now, maybe they didn't jump it in the in the commercials themselves. But that's but what I mean, remember everybody. when the, <laughs> do you remember that? Well, that but that very. The, go ahead. You talking about the video where the guy launched it over the thing and the airbags went off on impact? <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I didn't even have to say it. You knew what I was going to talk about. Yeah, that's. I mean, there's got to be a trillion views on that, and it's mm. just like correlating that to today's time when a Joe Schmo is in a dealership and they say, this is an off-road capable vehicle. Well, they yeah. go off-road not knowing what it's actually capable of right. and they get themselves into trouble. So I feel like, I feel like there's kind of like a, a give and a take with these new SUVs and off-road seems to be more, well, more I think, now out of the dealership. Than yeah, it, it, it does because dealers, you have to remember though, dealers want to sell cars. That's all they care about. They yep. will tell you anything and everything to get. They the know car nothing out, about off, the cars they're selling, but they will tell they know, you here. <laughs> they, they know nothing. The other part is it's like anything else. It's seat time, right? You have these people that have never been off road in their life, and they see an ad for a Raptor, or they see an ad for a TRX, and mm -hmm. all these videos of people jumping, and they're like, "Well, I can obviously do this," even right. though they've never done it before. Right. And it's like when we go to the racetrack, right? You when uh. the GTR first came out, <laughs> like when the Nissan GTR first came out, um, it 
it was the hero car because you could do stuff. A novice could go out in a GTR and the car would <clears throat> constantly save you from throwing it in against the wall. Hard where if you drove itself, drove itself. Where if you put that same driver in a in an unprepped Miata that's mm -hmm. completely analog, they would throw yep. themselves into a wall. First right? corner. Yep. So it's it's <laughs> it's seat time, it's experience, and you get to the point, and we're kind of getting into the weeds here, but you you get yeah. to the point where you know anything. Just like Ryan said, when he had a factory test driver take him out in a car, mm -hmm. his mind was blown because he never expected the car to do what it does. That mm -hmm. guy has probably thousands of hours of seat time making cars do things and driving them to, to the limit of their capabilities, I, right. while at the same time, he's comfortable in doing it. Where somebody like myself or, or Nick or Ryan or you guys, it would be difficult. And which is why, and I always say this, like when you go out with an expert, Mm -hmm. experts are experts in their field for a reason right and it, it all has to do with the amount of experience you have the amount of seat time that you have an expert could take a an okay vehicle mm -hmm. and make it look like a hero where a novice can take a fantastic vehicle yeah. and just make it look like garbage because they don't have any experience i think the pro tip that we should pass along here to mm -hmm. anybody watching who's interested in taking an suv into the woods or whatever is yeah. basically the first few times you do it please stay on the mark mm -hmm. forest roads do not go on a gee i wonder if i can get through here because if you're wondering that you probably can't um right. also respect snow <laughs> these ads with snow where it's like light and puffy, but the moment you hit ice or you hit like finished ice yeah, is ice in, in the Northwest, we have this thing. It's, it's like a, it's like a cement. Basically it's this mix between slush and ice. Mm -hmm. And people always comment on this in our videos are like, I could drive through that. And you're like, no, you can't. It's literally a block of ice with water on top of it. You cannot drive through that. Right. Um, it, the traction is zero. Um, you yeah. know, respect, Just know your conditions yet, yeah, know your conditions, but also start small. Don't go be like, Oh, I got a, I got a TRX. I'm going to go, you know, right. Jump it over here. No, I mean, you're, you build up to that. If you want to do that, great, but build up to it, you know, do something, yeah. small. put a wheel up, feel how the vehicle walks, works, um, you know, how it responds, spend some time. Don't just try to blow it all in one weekend. And most importantly, watch driving sports TV on YouTube, and we will show you how all these systems work. Sorry, there you go. That's my plug. <laughs> that, that's a plug. No, no, no. But that's fine because I mean, listen, you guys do test everything. So, yeah. and I try to right. walk people through how, what works and what doesn't. And some people are like, well, you know, I could drive a Camry through that. And I'm like, that's not the point. Anyway. <laughs> right. All right. So we're, we're coming up on time right now. So what, what final thoughts do you guys want to leave with people regarding kind of an old school analog SUV um, mm -hmm. versus a new one? Nick, do you want to start? Oh, man. Uh, that's tough. I don't really want to start, but I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, just do your research. Just do your research. Mm -hmm. SUVs, I mean, if we're talking about just the broad spectrum of an SUV, we're not specifically talking about off-road. So just for, for whatever you want, just do your research and, and figure out if a previous model that's a little less complex mm -hmm. is right for you so you can work on it or you can have someone that you know work on it or you can go on the flip side and go super new and get something that's just pretty much computer and electric motors where you have to take it to a special person. Granted, you probably get a faster car, you get electric and things like that, or you go on the other flip side and get gas. So just do your research, figure out what's right for you. And um, if you are taking it off road, know where you're going and don't get stranded, please. Yep. I would say uh, looking at old school, I, I still think it makes sense if you want to do any like serious off-roading, it still makes sense to buy the old school systems uh, because we're still a few years away from a reliable we're getting there, but I think that today, something like a Forerunner or something like uh, even a Jeep Grand Cherokee is still going to be more care capable off-road than most of the more mm -hmm. advanced options. And those are super advanced. They have nice little sprinklings of new tech and some old tech. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is don't overbuy. So often I see people like they say, I want to do a little off-roading. I'm going to go buy a Jeep uh, Gladiator Rubicon. And you're like, <laughs> right. Why? Why? Why are you going to spend yeah. 70 grand on something that is miserable on the freeway and extraordinarily capable off-road, but 99% of the time you're you're commuting with it. You know, right. that makes no sense to me. You know, if you want to go with a Jeep, get a Grand Cherokee. It can at least do the 90% well. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get a Gladiator. Don't just or, or I'm not Gladiator, but like, don't go out and just buy a uh, a Rubicon, you know, just mm -hmm. because 
you know, you know, your friend has one or this or that yeah. for whatever reason, buy according to what your actual lifestyle right. needs are. It might be a CX-50 Meridian from Mazda. It might be an Outback Onyx XT. It could be all the, you know, but if you're going to like trailheads, an SUV is sure. totally fine. If you're going beyond the trailheads, then you seriously need to look at it. But please drive them, ride to them, find somebody who has one and have them take you off-road because you might see what they're doing and go like, I'm never going to do that. And then uh -huh. boom, you just saved yourself 20 grand. Congratulations. So uh -huh. that, that's my tip, I guess. Mike, and I, and I, yeah, for I, I'll go and, and, and just kind of uh, cement what you both said, right? I think it's like anything else. You have to, you have to, one, you have to know your capability, mm -hmm. right? Because like Ryan just said it perfectly, you might, see what these vehicles can do and be like, oh, I'm never going to do that. And I know I have personally experienced this where mm -hmm. I've driven an off-road vehicles and an off-road cor well, uh, courses. And I've said, I will never do that. Yeah. So I, I don't, don't need, Rubicon. <laughs> exactly. Because I, I don't need it. I don't need um, that. <laughs> you don't. So I think that the, for the majority of the people, be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. save yourself money. If, if you feel like you know what, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to dive in with both feet and I'm going to take lessons. That's a big thing. Maybe a little off There's of education. There's so many schools around. Right? Or even so clubs. many schools. Club. Right. Clubs are great. You can just find them on Facebook. Exactly. And you can really, you can learn how to properly go off-road. If mm -hmm. you like it, okay, then fine. Then yeah. make the investment, buy the vehicle you think you can grow into. Um, but I again, I think for the majority of people, Start out slow. Start off in, if you're getting into off-roading, start off slow, something used. Get a feel for it. If you like it, you can always yep. move up. But save yourself money, like Ryan said. Don't go out and go bananas and spend 75 grand that when you think you scratched it for the first time, you're going to freak out. Like, don't, don't be that person because <laughs> you're going to scratch it. Um, but educate yourself on the vehicles. Educate yep. kid yourself on the systems. Educate yourself on the level of off-roading that you actually want to do. Mm -hmm. Um and then go out, make an educated choice and have fun. Yeah, that's it. That's what it comes down well, to. That's what it comes down to. So, all right, guys, thank you so much for coming on the barbecue. It is always a pleasure to speak to you both. Um, and folks, uh, that's it. Obviously, check out Driving Sports TV. Um, you find everything that Ryan and, and Nick are reviewing. They review some amazing stuff. Obviously, hit the Hemmings Classified. If you want a newer classic off-road vehicle, we've got a ton of them. Check out our auctions as well at Hemmings.com. And uh, that's it. We'll, we'll see everybody later. Thanks again. We'll see you later. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button. And we'll come to you every week.